I'm so excited to see so many wonderful faces here today because holy moly, do we have an amazing discussion topic today. And if you are like me, maybe a little bit of a people pleaser, maybe a little bit of an Enneagram 3 uh, or a Myers-Briggs uh, ENTJ, ENFJ, you know, you kind of see conflict and instead of going towards it, you run away from it. <laughs> You're like, hello, conflict over here. I'll be on the other side of the room. And so when I was thinking about 2022 and how we can maybe embrace those little challenges a little more confidently, I was like, wow, this woman is going to be our ticket to giving us sort of actionable, great steps to figure out how we can make conflict in the workplace a little less scary and a little more approachable. Now I say it every week, but hopefully you've done your Google stalking your Google research. You did a little Google before you popped on here today. But if you didn't, I don't want you to freak out. Don't worry. I'll give you kind of like the one-on-one highlights before Leanne joins us because that way we can skip right to the good stuff. We don't have to do the whole warm up of like, tell me about yourself. No, that's what Google's for. We don't need that. We, we, we Google things like that. So, but I'll give you a little 411 if you didn't get a chance to Google. But first of all, New York Times bestselling author. So I mean, that in and of itself, amazing. Uh, her book, The Good Fight, is highly recommended. We'll, we'll drop some links in there for you to check it out. But the book has gotten rave reviews. Obviously, you know, a topic that hits home for a lot of us. I know it definitely does for me. She also contributes to the Harvard Business Review. And my personal favorite kind of overall description, and I think it's one that we all just kind of will totally resonate with, is she calls herself a couch psychologist, not a couch psychologist, but more of a water cooler psychologist because she tackles the tough people issues without necessarily having to talk about your mother or how you grew up, which I, that to me like painted such a clear picture. I was like, boom, I got say no more. I got it. So hopefully it helped paint a clear picture for you too. But um, if you have questions, comments as we're going, that's what the chat's for. Don't be shy. Don't feel like you have to wait to the end. We're all in this conversation together. So please raise your glasses from wherever you are and help me in welcoming Anne. <laughs> cheers. Can you tea cheers? Absolutely. I'm, how are you? I'm well. How are you, Kim? I am doing great. I am so excited about our conversation today. And I, not to creep you out, but I, which is always a good way to start an interview. Um, I've listened to so many of your podcasts now that I feel like we're friends. We are. But, you're right. But, and then I realized like, oh wait, you've just been listening to her. <laughs> she hasn't been listening back to you, but I mean, you, you're amazing. Except you know, I have been listening to you uh, because, of course, Shed said you got to listen to Kim. And so it's it's now it's mutual. So we are friends. There you go. I <laughs> love it. Well, I I was so excited once I started to dive in deeper. Giacomo, welcome. Giacomo. <laughs> so many welcomes uh, to, to the crew. But I was so excited when I started to dig into like some of the podcasts that you've been on and all this stuff because I felt myself leaning forward every time with some of the stuff you were saying. And I was like, oh, that's me. Yes, that's me. I avoid conflict at work. Like, yes, that's me. In my head, like conflict means bad. And therefore, and you said something on this podcast and I wanted to like jump off with it right away because I don't know why it just, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, but you said, which I thought was really interesting. You said there has to be conflict in teams because if not, if one person could just do the job, then they would just do it all themselves and there would be no purpose for a team. Exactly. And I don't, I don't know why, but that like hit me like a ton of bricks. So where did that kind of nugget come from or how did you start to expand on that? This is a crazy story, but I, I just love documentaries and random knowledge. And I was watching a documentary about this guy named Pliny the Elder in 72 AD. And he wrote the encyclopedia of everything known to mankind. One guy wrote the encyclopedia of everything. So amazing, right? This one guy knows everything. And then Mount Vesuvius erupted and he got wiped out. 
And, and I was just thinking, yeah, in 72 AD, that's pretty much the last time we could accomplish anything without a team. So like putting a man on the moon, figuring out the structure of DNA or making your, your like, well, even making your macchino this morning probably took a team of people. So uh, that's what got me thinking about it. And, and if you're going to do that, if you're going to have a team of people, if they're all thinking the same way, what's the point? So that's why I got, so I'm like you, I don't like conflict at all, but I got to this conclusion eventually. I was like, oh, damn, it doesn't seem optional. <laughs> so I better figure it out. We have to, we have to embrace it. And so what would you say to someone like me, or maybe there's some other people that are like me joining us today, who just the thought of conflict, you just want to run or puke or cry or like, yeah. what is a good, like, what's your starter pack baby yeah. step of, okay, I at least have to be able to be in the room. Yeah. When conflict occurs, at work. I don't know if if uh, if anybody saw there were pictures in the New York Times this morning, pictures of the meeting between Emmanuel Macron and Vladimir Putin yesterday. And I want to actually make a meme of it because it's just the two of them in the room. And I'd say the table is about 30 feet long and they're sitting at either end of the table. And I was trying to come up with what's a meme, but I think it, that's it. It's like, this is me. And that's how close I'm willing to get to conflict. <laughs> this giant 30 foot table. Um, so I go back in my starter pack. I go back to the definition from the dictionary, because I think when we think about conflict, we have all sorts of images in our head, like personal relationships screaming at each other or, um, you know, getting 360 feedback earlier in your career that lands a little too direct or right. So I go back to the definition, which is just that the conflict is the struggle between incompatible or opposing needs, wishes, or demands. And uh, I'm in the Eastern time zone. It's what 107. I figure most of us have had like a good dozen of those struggles between <laughs> incompatible needs and wishes and demands by one o'clock on the average day. So it's really helpful to just go back and start there and say, do you have struggles between things that are incompatible? Like, you know, I, I, I want to be at Kim's show, but I also have 75 emails to respond to, or I'd love to do both of these projects, but we only have the resources to do one of them or you know, oh, I'm watching this presentation and I'd really like to give some feedback about how to make it better, but I don't want the person not to like me. So when we just go back to it's just a struggle, it's a natural, normal, healthy struggle between all the things in our world that sometimes are incompatible. And how does it work? Like, I guess it's different. Does it matter the size of the team? So like if you have a two person team or a three person team, I, maybe this is my own experience. I find that somehow smaller, smaller teams, and maybe that's because people don't speak up or I don't know, like it seems easier to solve like, well, you want to go left and I want to go right. So yeah. let's try to meet somewhere in the middle. But when you start getting into teams of eight people, nine people, 10 people, then I just feel like there's so many different personalities that I find it a little overwhelming. So when you when you're approaching conflict, does it matter the size of the group that you're dealing with? So ultimately, most conflicts are between two individuals. The problem is once we stick that in a team of 10 people, there's a, a dynamic that starts to get created around it. And I talk about this dynamic as you often have the wicked person, the wounded person, and the witnesses. And that mm -hmm. dynamic can be very much like a bullying power dynamic. And so then you've got to figure out all those pieces. So is there one person behaving badly interrupting, being rigid, not being open, some form of wickedness. Sometimes that wickedness is passive aggressive. Then there's often somebody, conflict doesn't get really uncomfortable until there's a victim of that conflict. Somebody who feels like that solution is going to hurt their team or their business or that that feedback is offensive to them. So we kind of need the the wounded person in the equation. But then when you've got eight or nine people, the reason it's so hard is instead of just having a conflict between the two of you, you've got these witnesses and the witness behavior can either enable the wicked person. <laughs> it can enable the wounded person. It can make the whole thing higher stakes, 
harder to get to the other side of. So you're very right. Uh, once we start adding more people to the dynamic, we can get, you know, one wicked person, wicked behavior, starting another person <laughs> into wicked behavior. We, we get multiple wounded people, a few other people just like checking their phones. <laughs> and so yeah, that dynamic can be messy. It's, and when you get into a situation like that, where you have one or two people that, you know, are kind of, everyone else is witnessing this yep. sort of transpire, what is sort of the white flag or, or something that you, if you're a witness and you're yep. kind of watching this car accident unfold, yep. what's something that you can kind of step in and do and say like flag, like yep. time out, like, can we just do yeah, this? So like, what is that thing? So number one, step in. And most people don't. Step in. Most people who don't like conflict, uh, most people who worry about the power dynamics, uh, they just kind of are frozen. Um, you know, we talk a lot about our human reaction of fight or flight, but we never talk. It's actually, there are three, fight, flight, and freeze. And we don't talk about how often we freeze in these situations. So your advice is great advice, which is A, do something, get involved. And when we can get a third person, instead of that tug of war dynamic, when the third person can do a few things. So one thing I highly recommend is usually when the people are really fighting, they're not listening well. So you can add big value by saying, that's, that's not quite how I heard her say that. Is, is that what you meant? And you can sort of be a broker of better listening and better communication. You can um, help them become more clear about what's the actual issue. So as I'm listening to you both, I'm kind of hearing that the root problem is this. Is that right? So you can you can do that sort of facilitative thing of saying, yeah, you guys are fighting about what's the right answer, but you haven't agreed on what's the problem yet. You can help to get to that. So the various different things that you can do will take the pressure off that tug of war dynamic and are really, really, really positive. So don't be that bystander. <laughs> Do find a way to bring the intensity down a little bit. The other thing I often recommend is when we get really angry, we start speaking in judgments and adjectives and like big dramatic things. You and a lot of you language. Well, you're not listening. Well, you, you know, what exactly. are you going on? So the witness, one of the things you can do as a witness is you can what I talk about is simultaneous translation. It's not translating from one language to another, but it's translating from this highly dramatic, judgmental set of adjectives into a set of nouns. So if somebody's like, you are rushing us every time, it, you know, it's absolutely impossible. Then what you do as the witness is like, okay, so this feels rushed. So what's the deadline that's been agreed upon? Which thing in the plan feels like the the um, uh, the least doable? Um, what's the one thing if we could move one part of that deadline? What would be the most helpful? So being the translator to take them out of this big dramatic language and help them not invalidate them by saying their feelings don't count, but helping them to translate that emotion into something more concrete that you can do something with. So yeah. There's lots you can do. Just don't sit there and be a bystander. Just don't. Just don't do nothing. Don't do nothing. <laughs> Just don't, don't freeze and be a lump. Exactly. Uh, that's probably good advice for me. But, well, <laughs> what I think is so interesting is obviously you have been working. Well, again, hopefully people Google this, but if not, you've been working with executive teams for like 17 years. So this is not your first rodeo, no. as they say. So I actually I did mean, once end up at a rodeo with one of those executive teams. They're like, here, Leanne, I know you've only been on a horse once, but get on a horse and you're doing a relay carrying an egg on a spoon. I'm like, wow. So it really isn't my first go. <laughs> I love that. Maybe we'll stick to the more like Amazon type clients. Yes, then. Yeah, but, but never went to a rodeo with them. Yeah. No, I feel like, so, I mean, 17 years, I mean, you've probably seen all sorts of different situations and uh, different things that come up within teams, but I really loved this point that, that Brian is asking about and, and really trying to get to the bottom of, which is what are the different types of conflicts? that you've seen over, you know, this extensive career, or maybe what are the most common ones yeah. that you just feel like, man, you could walk me into any fortune 100 company. And I guarantee you, I'm going to find 
this because yeah. like this <laughs> is pervasive. Yeah. So in my first book, in in um, you first, I did this little taxonomy of toxic teams. What does it look like? And there were five. So the first one crisis junkie teams. So the kind of um, conflict there is actually we avoid making hard trade-offs and prioritizing, and we just wait for some emergency to force us. So um, true story, I was working with a team that was a bit dysfunctional. They were a big global shipping company, and they had pirates board one of their ships and take the entire crew hostage at gunpoint. And that's when they're like, then we were amazing. <laughs> and so that's a form of dysfunction is that you actually need a crisis to, because you, you sort of don't have conflict without it. So that's one. Um, the Royal Rumble team, I spend a lot of time in Silicon Valley. And I did once have a guy come over the table at another guy, and I was in the middle physically. Um, the Royal Rumble team usually is about people with pretty high IQs, but low EQs, and they don't listen well. So that's a very common one, Brian. Um, uh, I'm in Toronto. So if you want the Canadian and Minnesota version of it's uh, what I call the bleeding back team, because everyone's got knives in their back, because it's very passive aggressive. If you look in the room, everybody's nodding and it all looks fine. But yeah, exactly. But outside at the water cooler where I hang out, there's a lot of gossip and sarcasm and um, sort of using back channels to reopen decisions. So that's another one. But the other two might surprise people because the other two are teams where the conflict disorder is insufficient conflict. So uh, number four, the spectator team, where I haven't bothered to read the pre-read. Um, I just come in, I'm like, mm, I don't know. And so I just, whatever. And that's a huge risk because uh, you're not spotting assumptions. You're not spotting issues. It's a big problem. And then the final one I call the bobblehead team. And the bobblehead team there is a no conflict team. And so if you think about family feud, um, when, you know, Uncle Larry gives some harebrained answer that there's no way it's going to be on the board, but the whole team is like, oh, good answer, good answer. A bobblehead team is so cohesive. They care so much about maintaining harmony on the team that they just let all sorts of craziness, um, mediocre stuff go by. So the the toxic teams are actually a mix of very um, work-oriented conflict, like the Royal Rumble team, personality-oriented conflict, like the passive-aggressive team. But do not forget, one of the most common things I find in those Fortune 100 companies are problems of too little conflict, not too much. Well, I feel like... I. <laughs> I feel like I've been a part of several of those teams. <laughs> That's not good. Um, definitely the backstabbing team. I, I worked in New York at Condé Nast, which is like a notorious place. Oops. I mean, Devil Wears Prada. They made a whole movie about it. No, that, like, that, it's very, it, it's, it's, yes. You see me, Leanne. You see, I, you I see totally my soul. Agree. I was working with a New Yorker here who was the conductor of an orchestra. And he had moved to Toronto and he was really struggling. And he finally said to me quietly one day, he's like, I don't, I don't understand. And I'm like, that's because you're used to people stabbing you in the front. You're a New Yorker. We stab in the back. But, you know, there are a few spots even in New York where it's more the in the back. And that's apparently I have not worked with Condé Nast, but I have heard that, that that's their M.O. There's a lot of there's a lot of inner politics. I mean, all workplaces has inner politics, but the, the, like especially sticky ones. And we got a question or someone emailed me a question. I don't know if Sasha was able to make it today. So if you are Sasha, hopefully you're in the comments um, and know that I'm asking your question, but <laughs> she had emailed me saying, what advice would you give to someone who, tr who has tried to as much as possible kind of speak this truth to power, kind yeah. of like brought up something that maybe is not so amazing. Yeah. Um, but then it sort of backfires. Yeah. Like the, the power and authority come back down on them or they're just not heard. How do you, uh, what can you do if you feel like, oh, good job. Yeah. I like said some, I saw, what is that thing that's always in the New York subway? I, I see something, I said something. Oh, right, 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 you see right, something, right. say something. Like something. you said something, but then it's like crickets. Yeah. Like nothing actually happened. Yeah, that's a great question from Sasha and a really hard one. So I like to think about it in sort of three 
or four rings of support. So first you got to worry about yourself. So um, you cannot let that person um, affect your self-esteem. So you want to do little things like if they say something nasty about you, um, you know, something about, you know, you're, you're so sloppy or you're so immature or you're, they, they pick some horrible, hurtful definition. Uh, what I want you to do is take that trait and, and turn it into a behavior. So if they say you're, if they're, you know, harassing you about, you've given them some feedback on their work and, and you thought it was so good to speak up and make the presentation and the pitch really great. And then they, they come at you, you want to translate from the nasty characteristic into the behavior. So if they said you're sloppy, you want to stop and think about, okay, well, there were two typos in that. Because if we can, instead of letting people label us and, and label our character, if we can instead see it as behavior, then it's not as hurtful. So that's one tip to help you protect mm -hmm. your self-esteem from someone powerful who's trying to come at you. So that's the first ring. The next ring is your teammates. Cause I bet when you spoke truth to power, there were a bunch of other witnesses in the room who were like, good point, but I would never have said that. So can you reach out to them for support? Um, can you find ways, even if they say, look, I'm never going to speak up for you in the room, but just know that, you know, I'm with you or I agree or whatever, that's helpful. The other thing you want to do is make sure you start to build your network beyond your boss. So can I find social activities in the organization? Like I'm going to volunteer for the charity drive. I'm going to join the softball team. I'm going to find informal ways to meet other people. Or can you join a cross-functional committee? Can you uh, find other little creating little bridges beyond your boss so that if your boss goes on a power trip and tries to fire you or, or just speaks poorly of you, you've got other people in the organization saying like, no, 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 no. She's actually, she's great. So that's the third ring. And then the fourth ring of course, is your whole resilience that comes from your social support outside of work. So reconnecting to the things that people who love you unconditionally, the people who care. So protect yourself first reach out to some of those teammates to get a sense of where they stand, form those bridges out beyond your boss or beyond the powerful person, and then make sure your resilience network is really strong. So think about these circles of support around you. I feel like thinking about it in those rings is also just really helpful because you can kind of be like, at least for me, who's very type A and organized, you can kind of be like, okay, one, yeah. two, three. I think so sometimes also when those situations happen, um, can you tell I've got duck gone therapy? You actually <laughs> get flooded, like flooded. Yeah. They use it in my therapy sessions, everybody. Don't worry. Okay. Um, but flooded because you're just so usually like it, that's what it feels like. You have like right. all these emotions, like you're sad, you're hurt, you're angry, that you almost like your little brain is like a hamster wheel. It's like, Ugh. so yeah. I love the idea of having these four steps to kind of be like, okay, yeah. calm down, hamster brain. Let's yeah. go through these four steps and four rings, sorry, yeah. and, and just kind of process through. And I, I love this point that Julia made, especially when it comes to uh, ring number two yeah. and ring number three, when you're talking about either getting other witnesses around you or looking for that sort of validation, because how would you do that? Or how does that work when you add this really interesting layer, Juliana? So thank you for bringing it up, which is if it's family, if you work in some sort of like, oh, my dad owns the business and I started working there or my mom and I run this together. I have to imagine, I mean, you've worked with a lot of like fortune 100 companies. So I don't know if it's, yeah, it's probably different when it's family, right? There's like that added family dynamic. And we've also worked with some extremely wealthy families. Um, yes. Yes. Like, that, um, like succession, like that show. Yes. There's like, like with some of the families that I feel like that show is actually based on, which you're like, you watch some episodes, you're like, it was actually worse than that in real life. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> like that, hit. Yeah. that hit hard. Um, so it's just, just imagine how much harder it is and how all those dynamics are just compounded, right? So you have uh, normal power dynamics of who, because 
interestingly, you know, we were working with one family where, you know, it was three generations in the business and um, some of them in the second generation have chosen to work in the business. Some of them have chosen not to. So they're kind of all shareholders and kind of equal in that sense, but they're not all equal in their role as employees and they're right. And then they're from different families because there's like grandparents and aunts and uncles, right? And, right? Um, it is incredibly challenging. It's why, you know, that work is very rewarding is because, and there's also zero lines and boundaries between work and personal. So if there's addiction issues, if they're like all of the stuff that comes along with being a family enterprise, um, and then a few of the family enterprises we've worked with are also publicly traded. So there's this strange duality, of like pretending we're a publicly traded company. Well, they are, but pretending that's where the power is when actually all the family dynamics are, are really more profound and, and more important and salient in the moment. So Julia, it is, um, it's very hard work. It's not something I can tell you kind of overall, but it's, it's a lot of very slowly. And what we're normally doing in that situation is just brokering better listening. <laughs> like that's the number one thing we do is that they, they haven't listened freshly to each other in years. They just have pigeonholed one another. Well, I remember what you said when you were 14. I'm like, wow, okay, she's wow. you know 72 now. We could probably move on. Um, so it's just, and then the stakes are so incredibly high because you know, your whole family's wealth is tied up in this. You understand that thousands of employees' livelihoods are tied up. It's very high stakes. It's wonderful work because it's important. Um, there's no easy answers. There's no easy answers. And what I feel like probably what happens to I, last week, this is going to sound so random, but we talked about a, a fart rule um, where you, you, and it basically means like you're a little more lax around like family or friends. It's like, I farted, I burped, but like, yeah. whatever, you must love me no matter what. Um, whereas in, in the workplace, you, you typically, unless you're very close to your coworkers, don't have that same sort of like, I burped, I fart, deal with it. Right. Maybe you do. Interesting workplace. But I imagine it, it sort of leads into uh, Rajan's question here. Hopefully I'm saying your name right, which is I imagine in family dynamics, but also in, in corporate dynamics too, the, the sort of insults or yeah. like the little the little things, as I call them, pops yeah. that happen. How do you navigate that when those little pops and dings are not on a one-on-one -on -one level, but in front of other people? So going yeah. back to that sort of witness. Wounded, I was going to say, which are, like how great use of the witness. Great. Yeah. Like, if somebody's just like come up and flicked me, I am in no position to kind of enter that conversation well right? It's no. too hard. So this is a great situation for the witness. So imagine you're in a Zoom meeting and somebody's putting snide remarks in the chat, right? Great chance for the witness to be like, hey, you know, what's that about? Or what's the issue that we're not talking about here? Or, you know, can we actually have this conversation openly? It's a great place for a witness to just use open-ended questions to figure out, is there something that's going wrong down a layer? If it's you who's been pinged, don't stop and try and deal with it in the meeting, in the presentation. It'll just take you right off your game. Um, but it is a really important thing to come back soon after and just say, hey, I wanted to find out what was going on during the meeting. Like, uh, you know, I saw the comments in the chat. I didn't want to stop, but um, can you tell me what this is about? What do I need to understand? What's going on for you? How was my presentation landing? Those kind of open-ended questions that th there's a really important reason for that, which is when you're dealing with somebody passive aggressive, like somebody who'd put a snide remark in the chat instead of saying it directly, you need to do two things. You need to make it easier for them to say uncomfortable things openly. So you can start your presentation by saying, I'm really keen to hear any issues, anything you think I could have done better. So you want to make it easier, invite like almost them. welcoming the conflict. Welcoming it. Like, bring it, on in. it. And you want to make it less comfortable 
for them to do the snide microaggression BS. Um, and so you do that by saying, you can put that in the chat, but you're going to have to have a really uncomfortable conversation with me later in the day where I call you on it. So because um, passive aggressive behavior is a result of it being more comfortable to say something in a snide, passive way than to say it in an open way. So you need to tip the balance by making it more comfortable to say it openly and less comfortable to say it like a total arse. Being passive. Exactly. Well, and I think it's going to, I'm so glad you used the example about Zoom because I do feel like, and whatever you want to call it, this work remote culture, the great resignation, the great reshuffle. I don't know. They branded it with so many wonderful marketing terms, but the truth of the matter is, is like, we're all working from everywhere yeah. and a lot of it's online. And as we know about online bullying, et cetera, it's much easier to write a little snide comment in a chat or yes. a Slack or an email yeah. than if you were all in the office. I mean, I guess you could be a little snide at the water cooler, but still, even when you're face to face, it's it's a little harder yeah. to kind of openly say I something or, or yeah, 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 yeah. I roll to grade somebody. Yeah. Whereas online, it's a little easy. To, yeah. And especially with like emojis, like someone presents an idea and you slack somebody emoji that's like, boo, bad idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's definitely become easier. And I'm curious as, as we go more remote and more with Zoom, do you also find that, because I know a lot of the tech companies now are like, oh, well, now that we're having, you know, we're closing our offices in the Valley or whatever people can live from wherever, there's also going to be a lot of people getting hired that don't necessarily live in America that right. might live in other places, but yep. are being welcomed into groups. So I love this question from Amarashi, which is like, culturally, yeah. there's going to be some differences Yes, when, when people are now working together and with the added thing of Zoom. Yeah. That's yeah. already going to be weird. Yeah. So how have you seen that? I mean, I, again, I know you work a lot with executive teams and companies, but I imagine the last two years of your work probably differed a lot than like the five years before that. They sure did. Yeah. Yeah. So I've actually just finished um, a big body of work on the latest and greatest research about remote work and virtual teams. Yeah, I'm so excited. So I, I did my first keynote on it. We have a whole learning program around it because this is the problem with the future of work. So yeah. they, um, psychologically, as you mentioned with the negativity bias. Um, so A, you mentioned one direction, which is when we're when we're using a written communication, we are more negative, more edgy, right? Because it's a, the difference between having war in a trench and and you know, you think about warfare when it was a bayonet, right? <laughs> like that, that's one hell of an intense thing. Now warfare has drones flown by people in Nevada, killing people in Syria. So if you think about your Zoom chat and your Slack channel, the conflict is more like drone warfare, much less yeah. like bayonets, right? So that's a huge problem. But the negativity is not just on the offensive. So the other thing we know is that when we read a written message, we read more negativity into it than was even put in. So the scariest number I saw, my friend Nick Morgan wrote this book about virtual communication before the pandemic. He was onto this way before. Um, and he said, when you put an email that says, great job or nice work, 65% of people interpret that as sarcasm. Isn't that scary? So uh, we read an email, not with like a nice narrator reading the email, but we read it with like Darth Vader narrator from people. So we both, um, we, we are more negative when we communicate and we take that more negative message. And when we read one, we read it as even more negative. So that's a huge problem. Then you add, um, so let's get Amarachi's question and let's, let's just take it with one specific piece, which is, we know about virtual teams that we lack something that in the research they call mutual knowledge. I don't know why psychologists need to have ridiculous terms for everything. I just call it context. We don't have either shared content or shared context with people. Now, I'll give you a true story from when I was doing it. I was facilitating a session, big Fortune 100 company, 
And one of the guys in the session, this was a team effectiveness session. The guy was like not really participating much. I was getting a little frustrated with him. And his his sort of answers to my questions were just sort of knockoff answers. But at some point, somebody said that he was in Malaysia. I'm like, it's 5 a.m. for you. We're like what? And he goes, yeah. And because all these monthly meetings that I normally fly to California for, I still have to go to these meetings, but I've been up all night in all those meetings. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, so now we've got a situation where he's from Kuala Lumpur. He's got Asian cultural differences around conflict, lots of differences in the willingness to speak truth to power, those sorts of things. Plus I have this contextual information I was missing, which is he's been up all night and he's exhausted. So you know, in virtual teams, we're dealing with cultural differences, which are very profound. Um, and I was once facilitating a session in Bangkok and there was one leader from Colombia, like whoa, everything was like whoa, <laughs> sitting beside a leader from the Netherlands. <laughs> and he was like, oh. and it was half a day just to calibrate between them. So there are huge cultural differences. Now take that and say we're remote and we don't even know, like, when you're having a terrible, crappy day where it's pouring rain and you got soaked getting to the office, if you're all coming to the office, everybody's soaked. Everybody's feet are wet. Everybody's grumpy. If you're in remote locations, you don't have any of that context. You don't know what's going on. So this lack of mutual knowledge. So I've created a set of, of exercises for teams to help promote mutual knowledge. And I would be happy to pop in the comments later and share that with all of your listeners if it would be useful. But yeah, when we are trying to, okay, when we're trying to have um, healthy conversations and productive conflict with people where there's cultural differences, we don't know the context, it's so much harder. So yeah, I've been doing so much work in this space and I do think, I, and here's another wrinkle, what a lot of us are going back to is hybrid teams. Some of the people are together in an office and some are remote. This, do we, do we swear on the Kim Kaup show? Um, this, <laughs> this is this a This is not bleep. working well. This is a mind bleep. Yes. Um, so all of the psychological issues and hangups we have as humans, like the negativity bias. Now what's going to happen is we've got some people together with the oxytocin being released because they're having lunch together with trust forming with a lot of shared context and content. And then another group who don't have that information, who are on the outs, who start to resent what they don't know. And then the office people are resenting the people at home because they think they're not working as hard. So I actually think this hybrid scenario is a psychological minefield for the next, I'm going to say 24 months while we figure out how to work in that way. So that's where a lot of my energy has been going lately is figuring out how do we make this transition to hybrid teams because they are so set up to play into the worst demons of our nature as humans. Oh. Well, is that what is that what your resource is going to help with? Like your resource that you're going to pop in the chat later. That will oh, so help that's us a very, navigate this. Yeah, so that this is just one very specific tool from that okay. program. So so the program has to cover multiple things. So it has to have a module about just okay, how do I work well remotely? Cause I got to learn about boundaries and I got to like, there's so much I have to learn about how to communicate in writing and this negativity. So there's all this stuff about just, if I'm going to work remotely, I got to figure that out. Secondly, if I'm now on a virtual team and I have to collaborate remotely, oh, there's all sorts of information there. I have lots of interesting new research. So one of the things people love is I've been coming out saying, turn off the cameras. People are like, Really? My boss has said I have to have the camera on, but we've got two new studies showing us A, that when we're trying to get work done on a, a team's call and we have those little squares of people's faces, so much of our brain power is not going into the work. It's going into uh, what what is he thinking? Is he liking this? Is he unhappy? Is he grumpy? I don't think he likes this. Is that a furrowed brow? huge amount of our processing power. So if you're wanting to work on something, share the screen, look at the work product, have everybody's voices, but get rid of the camera. And then the other cool new study, emotional accuracy, empathy is way higher on, wait for it, the phone. 
when we actually call somebody and only have the voice and the tone and the pitch and that sort of thing, we are much better tuned in. So like the program about collaboration, that's the whole thing. That's the second module. And then we got this third thing, which is, okay, how do I manage a, a remote or a hybrid team and all this mess about who do I communicate with and how do I create a culture on a team? So it's a six hour long program, all of it, but I want to give everybody the one tool uh, that's going to help with that contextual information. There's nine fun exercises that you can do in your next meeting. And I would love if people try it, let me know. How does it go? Yeah. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Like, yeah. So, I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it was, you know, to Kamaran's question, I think it can really help with that judgmental aspect because you're right, there's going to be people judging the people who are coming in, who are judging people who are working out of the office. There's just, there's a lot of judgment yeah. going on. There's so much judgment going on and judgment is easier when we aren't with somebody. It's amazing. Humans, <laughs> like... It, and, and this holds for various different things like over the years. When we see people as them, not us, it's easier to maintain thinking of them as them and as an outgroup when we're not near them, right? We, as soon as we're beside them, we're like, oh, apparently you like love your kids and you know, mow your lawn. And, you know, when we are in proximity with people, oh, you, you know, heat your lunch in the microwave too. Okay. We we are much more generous. Uh, we give the benefit of the doubt. When we're remote from people, so much easier to judge. And we know the fundamental attribution error, this like 60 year old psychology finding, which is that when uh, somebody in our in-group behaves in a way we don't like, we attribute it to the situation. Oh, she was in a rush. Oh, he, you know, he didn't have this piece of information. When somebody in our out-group behaves in a certain way that we don't like, we attribute it to their character. Well, you know, he's a jerk. He's, you know, sloppy. He's a know-it-all. And so that itself perpetuates the judgment. And when we're remote, we don't have those interactions to tell us, oh no, it was just that situation, right? So if we don't have mutual knowledge, if we don't have context, we tend to judge more. When we're distant from somebody, we judge more. When we consider them our outgroup, we judge more. So there's a lot of judgment going on these days. There's a lot of judgment going on. And you're right. The only way, that's why you need to confront in a good way, this sort of like you're, the good fight. Like you have to, we have to take on this with a vigor and almost in a weird way, like an excitement, like we, there's going to be conflict. Like yeah. let's, let's right. get excited. I right. love the point that you were making earlier. Like we're welcoming it in. Yeah. Like, cause we know it's going to happen no matter what. It's kind of like, if you're going to have house guests, at least welcome them in instead yeah. of begrudgingly being like, let's try to keep that house guest out because we don't like conflict. So you want we a don't tip want to make it, in. If you want a tip to make it easier, when you're going to invite it in, um, invite it into a box. So what you can say is, I'm going to give this presentation today. I'm really thinking about um, whether this is going to be relevant to this particular customer group. So when you're watching my presentation, I'd love your help. Can you think like that customer? Can you put yourself in their shoes? And then I'd love to hear how I could do a better job connecting with them or what examples would be better. So then at the back half of the presentation, when you get, okay, I was thinking about that customer and you've missed the example from our Acme project. And I think that'd be great. That's easier to, first of all, it's going to be more useful and constructive and it's easier to take on board instead of, yeah, as you were talking, you, you like, you don't have any executive presence. I don't even know what you're doing here. Right? So if you're going to invite the conflict, um, one of the tips to get more comfortable slowly is to, you know, be really clear about what kind of conflict would be constructive. Um, you can say, I know these, I've done B2B, but I've never done B2C. Can you help me, you know, find all the risks in my plan from a B2C perspective? So when you invite it, but in a, invite it into a certain room, please come to the parlor because, and you don't have to be throwing clothes uh, under the under the bed, right? Please, I welcome you into my parlor, which is a safe space. So that's a tip if you don't like conflict to still invite the conflict, reduce the passive aggressiveness, but make it manageable for you. 
And when you when you invite it in, you know, to the, use the example, hey, can you think of yourself in this position and kind of almost like devil's advocate? Like, can you think about yourself as the customer and tell me, you know, objections that you would have or things that yeah. I might have missed? It, I love Jen's point. If you are receiving mm -hmm. that feedback, um, how can you how can you receive better if people yeah. are flagging things for you, whether it's, I know her question results to a cultural difference, but I'm curious, even just on a, on a bigger scale yeah. of just receiving. So this may surprise you, Jen, but you know, one of the things that I say is, you know, we hear so much about authenticity these days and right. I, I'm actually a fan of authenticity. I don't think it's carte blanche to just like behave in any way you want, you know, regardless of how it affects people. But authenticity to me in so say we take Jen's example and someone has just said, like, you don't understand our entire team in Malaysia, the way you're behaving. We can't behave that way. You're so, um, you know, callous to that. Like maybe they've said something like that. The first thing I do is I actually admit that that's hard to hear. And sometimes you can barely find words because you're so like, like I didn't mean to offend them and I, I'm trying to, every, I want everybody to like me. So sometimes all you can say is like, ow. And it's okay ow. to literally just say, ow. And and that signals to them that, that first of all, what they said landed with you and that you would like for them to be maybe a little bit delicate with you because it hurts. And then you can say, okay, I'm, wow, that's hard to hear. You know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm trying so hard to, to be the leader you need. So, uh, you know, I just want to let you know that I care about that. And it hurts to hear that. Okay. So just get that out of the way that buys you 15 seconds to take a breath. And then you can say, okay, um, what do I need to understand? What am I missing? What do you need me to know? Like those kinds of big open-ended questions. Because when we jump to the conclusion about what the problem is, we usually <laughs> jump in the wrong pool. Like, no, that wasn't the issue. So better to just say, second, say, what do I need to understand? Yeah. H how do I need to think about this differently? Those sorts of big open-ended questions. And then let them go. And if you need to ask a clarifying question, the more they're talking at this point, the better, because the more they're talking, A, we know that that gives you time, but B, we know people like us more when they're talking. So, so if we let them talk, their, their anger and, and issues are going to dissipate a bit. So then what you want to do, and this is the major secret of all productive conflict, is before you say a word, what we would want to do in that situation is defend ourselves or say why it has to be this way or... If you can say, say ow, right? Say this is this matters to you, find out what's going on. And then the final thing you need to do is speak their truth before you speak your own. So say, okay, so my sense is that, you know, in the way we've set up these meetings, I'm asking you to disagree and spot risks and, you know, speak truth to people where you're not going to be comfortable doing that in person. Did you know, is that is that what you're saying? It is amazing how if you take the time to speak their truth before mentioning one word of your own, it will feel completely different. Now it's going to feel like problem solving. Now you've earned the right to say, okay, here's what I'm trying to accomplish in, in this, in the example I'm giving, you could say, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that there's no risks that I've really thought everything through. What would be a better way to accomplish that that would fit with your culture, how that would work in your environment? then you can go to what you're solving for or your truth. So yeah, that's, and that works in relationships. It works with teenagers. I have tried and tried and tested this approach on two teenagers. Um, so yes. It's mom approved. It's mom approved. I need a stamp. More importantly, I think it's teenager approved, which is a harder stamp to get. I don't even know if that stamp exists. That That's the hardest stamp. <laughs> and if you can get teenager cool approved, go buy a lotto ticket. Because yeah. all of us are losers. Yeah, I, I, I haven't size. got, I haven't, I haven't bought a lottery ticket yet. <laughs> yeah, that one's very, that one's very elusive. I've never gotten that one. All the teenagers are like, 
plays. I'm still trying to, I, I, I'm, I'm halfway there because I have all the lyrics to Taylor Swift's all too well memorized. And then she releases a 10 minute version with all new lyrics and I'm still struggling with the bridge. So I was close for a while, but I lost close. It again. the 10 minute version, it is a lot to memorize. You, it's, it's a lot to minutes. memorize. A lot. It's a lot. A lot. I'm getting there. Though. I'm getting there. You're getting there. Baby, <laughs> steps. Baby steps. Okay. This is my favorite part of our <laughs> conversation, which is basically sort of how I, and, and you, you, by the way, I love that you admit to that. So you're, you're the nerd so that we don't have to be the nerd, by the way. Cool. I'm not, I'm not actually saying that you said that. No, no, it's true. I'm just repeating it. I, I don't feel totally like, happy to Kim's be the bully. Kim's a bully and called, <laughs> bully and called Leanna a nerd. No, I didn't. She said that. She right. said that and I'm repeating it. Kim did um, not but say I, that. I said it. I did not say that, but I'm excited because this is my favorite part because I'm like, great, you're going to be the nerd and okay. we're just going to copy all your homework okay. and this is going to be, this is going to be fantastic. Okay. So what is something that you have started using lately or doing lately that you love? It could be like an app you started using or something that you're just like, I'm obsessed. What's that? Okay. This is my bullet journal. Oh, okay. I've heard of those things. Yeah. It's, you can sort of bullet journal. This is my bullet journal and I use my bullet journal with my time timer. So the time timer is to help you do like Pomodoro blocks for productivity. So I say, okay, Leanne, you can only have 30 minutes on LinkedIn right now. And so the bullet journal keeps me focused on the most important things. And my time timer <laughs> tells me when I, I need to stop. Those are my two favorite things. Okay. Wait, where did you get that giant timer? Is that on Amazon? No, it's for where kids with that? ADHD. It's for kids with ADHD. Yeah. To help them with their morning routine. Cause apparently it's more visual helps them the time timer. Yes. On, at your local Amazon store. <laughs> I am definitely going to be purchasing that. I love my time timer. It's the best. That thing is awesome. Yeah. I know. I love it. Um, what is the next thing that you are hoping to learn and it could be it could be work related or it could be not work related it could be like i want to learn i don't know french or how to make a souffle yeah at home i'm i'm actually um four months into taking hip-hop dancing for my first time ever at 50 so um but for work i'm really i know it's, it's not pretty um for work i'm really excited because for one of my speeches called change has changed uh, i talk a lot about how important it is that we manage people's anxiety so i'm learning now going into all the primary research on what's called emotional contagion which is how our emotional state leaks and spreads onto other people and this cool new study that if we invalidate someone's emotion or tell them to like you know stop being so upset that it actually has this big effect of increasing it. So emotional contagion is what I'm learning about right now. Oh, so interesting. I feel like you would nerd out on that in like the best way possible. <laughs> okay, well, speaking of emotional contagion, okay. I am curious if there are, obviously we have Shed who introduced yeah. us. Thank God Our for Shed, I know he had yeah. to jump early. But are there people that you follow, whether it's on LinkedIn or yeah. maybe it could be Twitter or other platforms, yeah. and, and maybe they're not people, maybe it's brands or something that you just, you're like, I feel emotional contagion of happiness. Like when I see your posts or your updates, like it's just that person or brand, it, it's just like a bright light to you. Okay. Can I give you three quickies? Yeah. So John Alexander is in the UK and releasing okay. this new book called Citizens, how solving everything or the, oh, I got to get the subtitle wrong and it's so good. Fixing everything might just take all of us. It's, it's about okay. how we need to shift away from a consumer society to a citizen driven society. And I'm nerding out on all of his amazing work about how the world's going to change. John Alexander Amazing. Um, number two, uh, as a working mother, I adore the work of Tammy Hearman. Um, and she um, she has this amazing, her book is called Reframe Your Story. And she helps you just think differently about what it means to be a working woman. Um, and then I showed you my bullet journal. So I'll give you something totally different on Instagram or uh, YouTube, Amanda Rackley, R-A-C-H-L-E-E. -E, and she's this amazing 
bullet journaler who's like an illustrator. She just did a big Sephora beauty campaign. She's just the coolest person. Eye candy, if you want to try bullet journaling. She's many years into it, and her YouTube videos on how to bullet journal are oh, amazing. Amanda Rockley. Okay. I can't. I love some good eye candy. So I'll yeah, go down the rabbit hole on that one. Amazing. For sure. Um, okay. Two more. Okay. This one is if every single person who's here today, yeah. the next time that they experience conflict, if yeah. you could have them all do one thing yeah. when it comes to conflict, yeah. what would be like the one thing that you'd be like, guys, this is what, this is what I would have you do. That validation technique I just talked about. So don't start telling them about your truth. Zip it. <laughs> Zip it and ask a question to find out their truth. If you can, to whomever, to your partner, to your boss, to whomever, uh, if you can get them to help you understand their truth, if you can speak their truth first, you won't even be having conflict anymore. You'll just be problem solving about hard things in the world. Um, if you do that, and I have a YouTube video about how to do it that I can share um, the techniques of how to do it. But yes, if you do that, you won't have conflict anymore for the most part. You'll you'll just be problem solving. I, I love that. And I should say to everybody, if you go to sendmenotes.com, I should have said this at the beginning, um, we'll send you all the notes from I know, I have today. to go through and so, see all the things I've promised. <laughs> so all these like books and references, yeah. whatever, I'm sure people are like, Damn, yeah. why are they listing things so quickly? Yeah. Um, if you go to sendmenotes.com, we'll send those to you. But I yes. should have said that earlier. People are probably like, dang it, uh, my hand hurts. Okay. Last and final question, which is okay. we love homework. This group loves yeah. homework. If yeah. you could give us all a homework assignment for yeah. the next week, yeah. it could be anything. It could be work related. It could be life related, whatever. What would you have us do? Maybe watch a certain show. I will make one for you shamelessly. Everyone should go buy your book. Thank you. I will say, I will well, say that. I'm all good with that one. If you everyone do, should go. You off the other homework. <laughs> everyone should um, go do that as homework. But yeah. what would be the homework assignment that you would give all of us? So in the book, I talk about a concept I call conflict debt, which is just like credit card debt. When we let those conflicts pile up and we we don't have them because we're like, Ugh. so the homework is go look at your statement, find one conflict debt that you're in right now, and go make a payment. So whether that, whether that's in a relationship where you're like, you know what, I haven't been saying this to you and you deserve for me to say it directly, whether it be at work that, you know, I've actually been thinking that I'm not on board with this project and I haven't said anything somewhere, anywhere in any relationship, find one conflict debt and go make a payment. You don't have to pay it in full if you can't, but just go make one, make the minimum payment. And I know, uh, like, Liam's like the IRS taxes are due everybody Come yeah. after ya. go pay your debts off. Yep. That is such an amazing one. And where can people keep learning from you, finding all this new yes. research that you've been talking about? <laughs> what, what channels do you spend the most time on? Yeah. Great question. So, um, people who subscribe at leannedavy.com, I have once a month, this amazing newsletter that gives you the theme for the month, a whole bunch of reasons. I have a free resource every month that only the subscribers get, and it has links to research and all sorts of good stuff. So if they go to leannedavy.com and subscribe, that's one place. And then um, I like to think about my LinkedIn as my couch. I'm trying to make my LinkedIn comment section the coolest couch on the internet. So come to LinkedIn. That's where I hang out. And really tag me if you think there's an interesting conversation for me to get in. Come over on my couch, pop yourself down and 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 let me know what you're thinking. So um, if you want the insight on the research and the tools and that kind of stuff, subscribe at leannedavy.com. If you want to just pop down on the couch and chat, LinkedIn. I don't and, and care, don't lay down on the couch. Don't be like it all started <laughs> like, Leanne, when I was five. And then I think that's where the conflict started. I always say don't lay good, on the couch. Just sit fight, on it. You'll, in the good fight, you'll see that I talk about my mother, so you don't have to talk about yours, right? <laughs> I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm just a water cooler psychologist. It's okay. 
I just deal with it with the stuff out there. Oh my gosh, you have been such a delight. Thank you so much for imparting so much wisdom on us. I just I so appreciate it. And I know everyone else does as well. So <laughs> it's been you. so fun. Thank you so much, Kim. I love it. Well, everybody, this has been so much fun. If you are having fun, which spoiler alert, you should be. Uh, we will be here next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, same time, same place. Bring your favorite cup of caffeine <laughs> and all of your questions. It is going to be fun. Next week, we have Vanessa Van Edwards. She is also very much like the Anna New York Times bestselling author. She has a new book coming out called Cues, which I'm very excited about, especially as somebody who makes a lot of facial expressions. It's one of those things where it's like, you know, if you squint, it means you're lying. And if you look away, it means like you're being coy. So I'm very excited to speak with her, but thank you guys so much for joining and have an amazing rest of the week. Bye everybody.